My name is Nick Butter. I'm an endurance athlete, an ultra runner and motivational speaker. January the 6th, 2018, I leave the UK on an 18 month expedition to set the world record for running a marathon in every country in the world. That's 196 marathons, one marathon in each of the 196 countries. All right, so it's now the five o'clock on the 6th of January, 2018. The trip starts here. I'm nervous, excited, and let's see what the next few weeks brings. Two, 14, 20, 31, 87, 156, 206, 225, 267, 320, 345, 369, 375, 400, 428, 517, 530. I'm doing this because my friend is sadly dying. Kevin was diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer and was given two years to live. Kev said to me, don't wait for a diagnosis. Get out there and do something. Nice to finally meet you, man. Yeah, you too. Thank you for, uh, for making the trek out here. No, not at all. I, I, I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> well, here's the thing. I was thinking, I was, I was uh, thinking about you this morning and part of the inspiration for this whole adventure um, is this encounter, this friendship that you struck up with this guy, Kevin. Yeah. And, you know, this, this mantra that kind of repeats in your head, that loops in your head about the fact that life is short and yeah. life is precious. And you didn't want to look back in old age and have regrets about stones unturned. Exactly. And here we are two days from, you know, Kobe crashing and, you know, nine people yeah. perishing in yeah. a helicopter accident, literally about- Close by, right? Yeah, very close by, yeah. like a mile and a half- That as, close, as the crow, wow. as, the, as the crow flies, like it's literally right over the hill yeah. over here. You know, in the wake of, of that and the sadness and, you know, the reflection on a, on a mm. life very well lived is a global conversation about the preciousness of life and how short it is and how, how, yeah. how fragile it's it just a, such a shame and the same for Kev really that someone has to die or be told they're dying in order right. for the conversation to start, you know? Yeah. But hopefully through a bit of the running that I've done, maybe we'll keep talking about it, you know? Yeah, so um, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you just completed this whole thing in November, right? So yeah. it's still very fresh. This yeah. Yeah, two years of of being out there, and the many years <laughs> leading up to it, of preparation yeah. and and logistics. Like it's just, I can't even wrap my head around what you've accomplished. And it's a it's a feat that has come up a couple times on this podcast because I know it's something that Dean Carnazes has always wanted to do. And the last time he was on the show, I was like, "Come on, man, what are you doing?" And then it was like, "Nick's out there doing it." <laughs> I think you were just about to complete it at that point, and so I've literally didn't. just spoken to him oh, two you? days ago in in uh, in London. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, what did he say? And he said uh, he said he said tell tell Rich that I bow down to you. <laughs> and I <laughs> said and I said it really should be the other way, in which uh -huh. we, we swapped and I bowed. But he um yeah he's you know. He's, he's a legend um, and yeah. he will do it. I know he will. Right. And he'll smash it. It's just, I know how long it takes to plan a, a you know, we did it, but it's mm. a bodged job. You know, mm. when Dean does it, it won't be quite how I, we I don't it. think that anybody <laughs> could do something like that without there being just, you know, countless 
uh, things that come up, unforeseen obstacles and cataclysms yeah. that throw you yeah. off course. I mean, the, it's just too you know enormous of an undertaking for something like that not to happen. Yeah, I'm just I'm just pleased we got to the end. I cannot tell you how many times we genuinely believed it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a case of oh no, we'll be all right. We'll just throw some money at it, or we'll just throw some people at it. You know, every possible option you have, which gets you through most things. Uh huh. We. We just we just came so unstuck so quickly, yeah. Um, and then it was just this kind of snowball effect of things going wrong, and then the multiplying of not having enough money, not having enough time, and then you know six weeks from the end, my we had the the first of many phone calls from my dad, who is a legend and has managed to do everything for me on this journey in, in terms of flight. So he was responsible for took the job. I think I pushed the job onto him really, um, or for booking all of my flights and yeah. to getting me from A and B and then C and D and then all the way through. Um, and he called me and said, we can't do it. You know, this was six weeks from the end of the trip. He said, we cannot mm -hmm. do it. And I, we were angry. We were crying. We were, you know, we've come this far and I was just thinking, oh my word, what are we going to do? And, um, and it, it went on for a few more weeks of saying we can't do it. Despite the many years leading up to the undertaking of all the logistical preparations, yeah. all the, you know, I can't imagine how many phone calls with bureaucratic agencies about mm -hmm. getting visas and permissions and all the like, and you think you've got it all sorted yeah. and stuff just happens, right? Yeah, well, I, I imagine that bef before we left, when we got to the start line, as you would with most races or events, you'd prep to the point that you're ready, mm -hmm. but it was so, so not that. We, right. we got to the start line and we thought, well, well we're, we're probably okay for a good few weeks, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we had as many flights as we could booked and we knew what we wanted to do, but we really had so much up in the air. You know, we didn't know how we were going to get into certain countries. We didn't, yeah. it was just hope. You couldn't get that sorted out way in advance, like figuring out, how, you know, the, the, the visas and the permit. I mean, I know it's tricky. There are certain countries where, mm. you know, they're just going to say no, or, you know, it's going to yeah. be close to impossible to get in there. And it, the problem is it's really volatile. So, yeah. you know, even if, even if we could, which it is, it isn't possible to do it all in one go at the beginning, right? even if we could do that, what's to, what's to say it won't change, you know? Right. And the amount of times we've had, oh yeah, no, that visa will be fine for years. You know, it was on the list of green. It was, it was, the, mm -hmm. it was one of the places that we thought we wouldn't have a problem. And then we did, and that was right. basic, basically because of some political skirmish or something like that that happens. Yeah. Politics, um, violence, protests, um, flight cancellations, airlines going bust, right. you name it. Yeah. And you don't have room for error when you're no. trying to do, I mean, let's just break it down. You're trying to do essentially two to three marathons a week in two yeah. to three countries, basically to stay on pace. Yeah, so we, we said we're gonna aim for three countries a week, every week, knowing that we were gonna have slip ups. And uh -huh. so, you know, sometimes I was doing five a week because we were making up time. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we were doing one because I couldn't get off a, an island, for example. So, right. You know, it wasn't just, oh it my wasn't just, God. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you left the trickiest countries, it seemed like, until the very end, the Middle East, right? Yeah, that was, I would love to say that was by design. And <laughs> well, yeah. no, I, I actually had a bit of a view that I wanted to leave some of the dangerous ones towards the end, because mm -hmm. if I was gonna get kidnapped or killed or locked up, at least I've seen a lot of the world beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> oh and my seriously, God. And, I, and I thought, well, you know, I don't wanna go and do these ones and tick them off and have the relief to then, mm -hmm. you know, something happen. But also it wasn't a case that, we, we we just couldn't get access to those places at the right mm -hmm. time. And and had we got access and something gone wrong, then it would have screwed up the rest of the flights along the line and, and that would have had huge financial implications. So right. it was tactical on one part and kind of just just wanting to wanting yeah. to see the world before anything happened. So Syria, Afghanistan, Iran, yeah. Lebanon, yeah. Israel, I, I would imagine yeah. all of those were super tricky, especially um, mm -hmm. you you kind of have to leave Israel in, until almost the end, exactly right? That. Because if you go to Israel, then you can't go to Lebanon, yeah. right? They're yeah. not going to let you in. You're on the yeah, yeah, you're on the money there. Exactly that. We we left it till the penultimate. So final one was in Athens, in Greece, obviously home yeah. of home of marathon. Um, and I uh, we went we went there on the November the tenth, and the one before that was Israel. And when I set foot on Greek soil, we still didn't know if they were going to be okay with me going to Israel. 
you know? Mm. Because, yeah, mm. you think it's okay, but right. you don't know. Until you're <laughs> and, there. And it's that last so word. So <laughs> lots, of, lots of like Argo-esque experiences, so much, yeah. you know, when you're trying to board a flight or get through customs, yes. where you're biting your nails thinking, Sli are they gonna let me in? Yes, I would say very Argo-esque, but slightly less glamorous and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and more kind of just uh -huh. being in dirty clothes, not knowing really what time of day it is. And I cannot tell you how many times I've got to a country and I don't know which one I'm in. Mm. That's how quickly they went, you know, I was standing at a, an immigration booth over and over again, and they'd say, so where have you flown in from? Yeah. And I couldn't answer them, you know, just yeah. because I was so exhausted. And then you get either put in a cell or you get questioned for hours, um, even in countries that are okay, because I've got visas in my passports yeah. that don't make me look particularly innocent. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I certainly haven't undertaking any, undertaken anything, you know, as vast and mm. incomprehensible as, as you, but I have had some experiences in the mm. Middle East um, one in particular trying to get into Pakistan that was, you know, it was it was like, you feel like you're in a Jason Bourne movie. Like yeah. it's very strange. Like yeah. I remember being greeted before I got off the plane in uh, Karachi. Mm -hmm. And before I even got to customs or baggage, I was greeted by two soldiers who didn't speak English, who demanded to see my passport, who just stopped me. I was the only Westerner on the plane coming yeah. in from Dubai. And they're like, you basically saying, give me your passport. And you're like, this is one of those moments, like, is this okay? Like once they have my passport, I don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah. They take me down to customs and there's a lot of, you know, sort of bickering in a language I don't understand. And it's it's super nerve wracking. And you think, yeah. what is going on yeah. here? Yeah, and you feel like guilty. Argo. Yeah, you feel guilty you know? even though you're not. You know, right. you feel like, like, well, yeah, like <laughs> what did I do? Yeah. I'm just here. And then they took me into a room, you know, and, and I, I'm like, well, this could be it. You know, yeah. you don't, you just don't know. I mean, it was all fine and all of that, but. I suppose the beauty of doing so many and so quickly is that you get that so often that you kind of become desensitized right, to it. Like, oh, here you know? we go again. And when you've got, a, you know, another AK-47 pointed at you and you haven't got your passport, <laughs> you know, and you think, oh, it's just, yeah. it's just a Wednesday. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but that it, at the beginning, you know, it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and then other times I've had people that, you know, these have got their weapons on, they have their uniform on, they have their badges, their helmets, they're, they're looking very um, intimidating. And they then come over and like, a huge smile lights up and they shake me on the hand and they know who I am. And you just think like all of my preconceived ideas of everything that's come yeah. through, you have no idea whether it's gonna be brilliant or scary. Yeah. Um, well, certainly I imagine it <clears throat> completely, you know, sort of changed your your view of the world and, and humanity. How could you, you know, how could you not be completely transformed after, yeah. you know, this experience? Yeah, and everybody warned me at the beginning, you know, this will change how you see things, this will change how you, you view the world. And, and I thought, yeah, I understand that, but, I didn't understand that. It was only when I finished, do I now have this new world view of, of everything that's going on? And even to be honest, it's just kind of compounded my belief already when I started and from, from Kevin's message about, we have this precious time that we shouldn't waste, but also there's so many people that don't have the opportunity. You know, whether it's in Britain, in the US, in other countries that aren't as wealthy or affluent, um, people are, mis you know, we are lucky, we are the lucky ones and yet we don't do enough with it. Mm. Um, and so coming back, you know, 54 countries in Africa, more or less all of those countries, I've, I saw situations which I, I just didn't realize existed, you know? Yeah. And, and then on the other hand, um, which I'm a big advocate for as well, our planet is in a really great place compared to how it has been, you know, poverty over, uh, in the last 20 years, people living below the poverty line has halved, which mm -hmm. is just outstanding. In yeah. my lifetime, the amount of people, uh, but. But then you go and travel and you think, hmm, I'm a bit torn. <laughs> and so this whole this whole world of uh, this whole worldview has completely changed me. And I've just got a lot of things on my to do list now that I want to do. Yeah, like what? Uh, I want to. So I've started this this uh, this charity which we're we're kicking off now um, called the One Nine Six Foundation, which is off the back of the the Running the World One Nine Six trip. And I want to I want to do some more. I want to help in a small ways, not start a whole new charity and make it. You know, there's lots of charities out there, but just be able to fund and, and support some other people that are doing good stuff. And um, there's that there's that thing. And then there's also the thing that I want to inspire other people to do the same thing. You know, I yeah. want people to travel. I want people to see the world. I want people to have that that view. And I often find that it's, it's a lot of hate and negativity comes from misunderstanding. And if we see the world and if we experience more cultures or religions or beliefs, then then maybe that hate will be reduced. And so when I'm visiting schools now for the next year on my 
speaking tour and trying to share this journey, I want people to realize that, you know, yeah. don't just sit behind a computer and live your world through your tiny phone in your hand. Like, let's go and do something else. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's very easy to just descend into pessimism and despair if you're scrolling and looking mm. at the news and thinking, you know, we're on the verge of an apocalypse and nobody's talking talking to each other yeah. in a productive way. And we're seeing the breakdown of Western civilization unfolding right before our very eyes. And and yet there is an indelible truth that that, you know, that we are in so many ways, like this is the best time to be alive. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And there are so many great things to celebrate and and beauty in the world. And and you know to be able to develop a, a deeper reservoir of compassion for yeah. humanity by virtue of that tactile, you know, one-on-one -on -one experience that yeah. I'm sure you had a zillion times over over the course yeah. of the last couple of years. I mean, you can't put a price tag on that. No, no you So can't. it's almost your responsibility to to share that. I yeah, think. I, I feel the same. And yeah. and you know, I went into it knowing that people said, "Oh, well, what what if." You know, what if you spend all your money and what if you spend all this time doing it and then you yeah. don't make it? And my view was- Your that, banker friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, my, and my family. <laughs> from, yeah, basically from the pub telling <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah, telling me, <laughs> you know, you're gonna risk it, you're gonna risk everything. But the beauty uh -huh. is, is that, you know, when you do something that you love and that it doesn't matter, you know, if nobody mm -hmm. buys my book, if nobody wants to watch a documentary, if nobody cares about what I'm saying afterwards, I've still had a great time in the process. It's not like I've done something that I was earning money and didn't care about. You know, it's I'm using money and it's given me this incredible worldview that I can't properly articulate yet. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel incredibly lucky, but I'm also kind of impatient to, to tell everybody else to do something similar. Right. Well, let's take it back to the beginning. Mm. So grew up in the UK. Yep. Dorset? Dorset, Dorset, yes. yes. Uh, active kid skier, right? First, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I was doing. I think my, my most kids. I lived out in the country, in the middle of nowhere. You have to do sport because mm -hmm. there isn't anything else to do. Um, my my friends lived all over the place, and I was either cycling ten, fifteen miles to get to school or to my friends, and then started running. But didn't really think anything of it. It was just a means of transport. Uh -huh. um, and and then I got into skiing. I was in the in the under nineteen snow sports England team. Did lots of bits of racing, did some instructing. Um, but then I had the voice of my my dad on my shoulder saying, get a real job. Time to get on with it. <laughs> yeah, come yeah. on, you've got to earn some money one day. And and he was right because, you know, ski careers are very short. They're, you know, you, you, you're kind of uh, outdated very quickly, even if you're the best. And I wasn't. Um, and so I got a real job, finance, banking, mm. selling my soul. In London? Uh, yeah, in London. I, to be fair, they were based all over the places. You know, I had multiple jobs, but yeah, uh -huh. London jobs. Um, and and I yeah I I enjoyed it because it was earning money and I was living the the life where you buy new shoes and jackets and you think that uh -huh. that's what you need to be doing uh, <laughs> and then you know you look back and you think oh my word what was I doing how long did you do that for it was uh, seven years oh wow it's longer than I thought too long yeah much too long it was it was a big chunk of you know my life and right. uh, and you know I don't want to as much as I. I kind of damn it in my mind, it still earned me money and it allowed me to do things. But if I could tell my kids, my future kids, my unborn kids at the moment to, to do something, it wouldn't be to do something that you don't enjoy for money. You know, mm. go and do something that you enjoy. And if, if you enjoy it enough and you do it well, then maybe the money will come. Right. <laughs> These pendulums tend to swing back and forth though. Yeah, like the kids, the kids of people like like you and me, then they go, they go into investment banking. Yeah, know. You know what I mean? They're like, enough of this like hippie, you know, it's all love kind of stuff. Like I need to make some cash. <laughs> It's you so, know, so like, true, so true. Um, I'm going to try. So it'll be best. interesting to see how that plays out. <laughs> no, you know, our best intentions are are yeah. often foiled. I, yeah, maybe. Yeah, you, uh, you're completely right. And that's, yeah. that's gone through my mind. But um, all I can do is hope and guide a little bit. Yeah. Um, but maybe that will happen and it will happen. You know, I still had that and I'm, I'm still in this point now. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're young, yeah. um, so so you're 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 doing the banking thing and that whole lifestyle, mm. uh, you know, hammering checks and and the whole and the whole thing. Where does the where does the itch like at some point I I would suspect and I'm projecting, but I would imagine like you start to get a little sort of discontent or or you know a sense of not feeling settled in your path. Yeah, um, I think yeah, absolutely discontent, but also not. You know, you get you get to the point where you're you're getting you, you you know you're going to die one day, and is this what I want to be doing until that point? 
You know, I started to think that more and more. And, and also when you're not sleeping well enough, you're not eating well enough and you're commuting and you're in smog and trains and traffic and you, you realise that your whole life is based around this job that you don't particularly enjoy. You know, I didn't actively not enjoy it. But looking back, it was just it's just not me. And if you, if you asked any of my other colleagues at the time, they would tell you, it's yeah. just, you know, it wasn't for me. Yeah, well, um, I mean, sitting across from you, looking at you, it's hard to imagine you, you know. I'm going to tell you that was a compliment. A I was, that was, yeah, I, exactly, I don't. <laughs> Listen, I, I was a lawyer I, for 20 yeah, years. Yeah. Like, I get it, you know. <laughs> I, I, I uh, you know, I can't stand that that life. But I, I realized that there was definitely more. And I think I got into running more and more while I was in finance because I wanted to have an escape. I think mm. so many people do. You know, you're getting into sports, some people getting into it for fitness or to escape or to to improve your mental health. Um, and it did. And then I realized that I was ending up turning down opportunities to go to races because I had to go to work. And then the kind of balance, like you say, the pendulum, pendulum shifted a little bit. Right. So ultra running at that time or just mm. 5Ks, 10Ks and that kind of thing? I think um, I quickly went from five, you know, from five to 10 to half to marathon to, to ultras pretty quickly because uh -huh. I wasn't very fast. I wasn't a good enough marathon runner. Yeah. You're um, like 253 or something like that, right? Good memory. Yeah. Slouch. It, no, it's not, but I... Not like 210 or anything. Exactly. Yeah. I need to take another 40 <laughs> minutes off that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I want to be a good marathoner. No, uh -huh. and I, I did some did some early ultras, some mm -hmm. just 100Ks, 120K things. And, and I thought, yeah, okay, I can do that. And, you know, I was finishing in the in the top three, top five regularly. And I wasn't really training, you know, I was just working and then driving to a mm. race and getting out and getting your trainers on and doing it and you're finishing okay. And you're thinking, hmm, maybe I can do this. And I'm, I'm not, I'm really not a very good runner still. You know, I'm not, I've done what, 600 and something marathons. I am not a good marathon runner. I just enjoy it. <laughs> um, and it's All just, the ultra runners say that. It's true, it's yeah. true. <laughs> um, it's because we're, it's because we're too slow to run marathons quickly that <laughs> yeah. we have to say that. But it's a big leap from saying like, oh, I wanna, I, you know, I wanna do ultras to, I'm gonna pursue a, a, a career or a way yeah. of making a living doing this, especially when you're in, you know, this white shoe industry where you're making quite a bit of money. It's not like, oh, you're a barista at Starbucks or something like that. You know that's, what I mean? Yeah, that's like true. it's a there's risk involved and you know, yeah. real world considerations. And it's not like, yeah, there are the Dean Carnazes out there and the people who've been able to kind of figure out how to do that, but it's not an easy thing. Yeah. To yeah, you're right. Create. But then but then having, yeah, you're right. So you say, how long were you doing that finance job for? It was, the answer yeah. is too long, you know, because for, for a good chunk of that, 80% of that, I was wanting to escape. But I think what led me to that cliff, which I, I kind of call the, the, the cliff of adventure and doing what I love, is that Kevin, who we talked about earlier, who was my big inspiration, he was just the final shove. Mm -hmm. You know, all the way through my life, I'd had little mini shoves towards that edge. And whether it was you know, my my headmaster when I was in school, whether it was a teacher, whether it was a family friend, I've had some really brilliant people around me that have loved the outdoors and adventure. And it just is kind of going in slowly and slowly. Um, and then you start to do this and then you have this idea. You know, you meet somebody like Kevin and he says to you, he's dying, he's told he's, he's lived for potentially only two years. And- Prostate he, cancer. Yeah, mm -hmm. terminal prostate cancer. Um, and you have this guy that is incredibly happy telling you he's dying. And you think, what? You know, you don't understand. I did really didn't understand how this guy was so happy and so genuinely um, positive in life when he was potentially going to live for only two years. And then it dawned on me that he realized that life is, you know, he's doing everything that he loves and life is so precious. And so that was the final shove. And, you know, it wasn't a case of, right, I'm going to go and run around the world. It was, what can I do to raise some money for them? And then I worked out that it had to be big enough to get the attention because I wasn't well known. Mm -hmm. And so... It just kind of spiraled, you know, it was, what yeah. can I do? And then I realized after one short Google, has anybody done it? And obviously following Dean, he's been threatening to, right. and he hadn't yet. And yeah. so let's give it a go. And it's kind of amazing that no one had ever done it before. I know, I, re yeah. I, I absolutely can't believe it. I feel very, really lucky and almost like a thief. <laughs> like I've stolen uh -huh. it from, like <laughs> nobody's like looking you, at me. You feel like an undeserved, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, wearer of the crown. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh. Because there's so many great people out there. I mean, especially Dean, but others as well that, you know. Yeah, but you made it happen. Yeah. That's the difference. I'm proud about that. I'm proud that I'm the first person to do it. And I'm proud that we did it in a, it really was a journey of horrendous lows and, and fantastic highs. And uh -huh. so it was exactly what it should have been. So just so I understand the timeline, you're yeah. you're starting to get into ultra as well. You're still 
Mm. working at the bank, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, you're, you're, you're banking ultras you, and you met Kevin at Marathon to Saab, right? Yes. Yeah. So you're able to like train and, and compete at Marathon to Saab while you're still working this job. I was working less then. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was, I think that was probably- So you already like got one foot out the door. One foot, bit. yeah. My, yeah. My whole soul was out the door. <laughs> it had been for <laughs> right. years, but yeah, yeah. yeah literally my, I, was, uh -huh. I was a little bit out the door and I was ready to go for it. Um, so the real exit plan is lining up enough support for this new crazy harebrained adventure that yeah. would allow you to train and, and you know, do this thing and yeah. feed yourself basically. Yeah, you know what? A lot of people have said that to me. The training didn't even go through my mind because I thought that the hardest thing in that whole year, they had two years from meeting Kev mm -hmm. to then thinking about it to then coming up with the idea. The idea was made and it was two years from idea to, to start line. Right. And that was mostly planning. You know, I turned up in Toronto, um, Canada, minus 25 degrees C, super, super cold on day one. It was January the 6th, 2018. And I got there and I realized I hadn't run a marathon for three and a half months. Mm -hmm. because the training- well, you like broke your ankle like yeah. four months before you started, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and But prior to that, I mean, I read <laughs> that, I read that like you were putting in 150 mile weekends. Yeah, big mileage. So you were putting in some pretty that was, yeah. epic, you know, blocks. I, I didn't realize that, that it was too epic at the time because I was just going for it and I, my body was right. And I was in really good, I actually think I was fitter then than I am now. Uh -huh. um, just because I was I was escaping from work and you know I was constantly running every possible minute I had, right? And then that two years was just like, oh my word, we've I've jumped into this world where I don't know what's going to happen. I need to make this. I may need to make this trip planned and logistically possible. I know I can run, and then I just forgot to catch up the running uh -huh. bit. And so, it was so the planning, the two years of planning yeah. transpired while you were still working at the bank. Half of it, yeah. I see, I half of it. They were very good to me, and they they said. Um, have time and they let me have some unpaid leave and then I ultimately right. didn't go back. Right. Um, and I was very honest with them. I had some fantastic, you know, you have good bosses, you have bad bosses at that time. I was very fortunate, a brilliant friend of mine now called Razi, Razi Ahmed, he, um, he, he supported me and he believed in what I was doing and he understood that, that there is more to life than work, uh -huh. which isn't, isn't that common in that yeah. industry. Um, and so um, he said, yeah, go and, uh, go and, Go and do it. So by the time you finally cut the cord and walked out the door for good, you had enough support lined up at that point and you were well invested in the preparation phase of all of this to be able to make it work. I I, let, I definitely jumped before we had everything lined up mm. um, because there had to be so much. I, I spent a lot of those two years planning it on my own. Um, and then another friend who I also met in the desert in the same tent as Kevin, a guy called Jeff, who's a really lovely guy, he's an Everest summiter. And he said to me, you know, you need to really get some people in your team. You need yeah. to pay some people. And I said, I can't pay people because I'm going to spend a fortune on this trip. And he said, no, you need to invest in the, the support because you can't do it on your own. And that was my first time I thought, hmm, okay, I, I probably should listen to that. Yeah. And I did. And I spent some money and I employed a, an assistant to help me work things out. And then skip forward to the middle of the journey where we had 19 people that were working, plus loads of volunteers that were making the trip happen, whether it was psychologist, um, nutritionist, performance manager, security, visas. And and then we got to the point that we couldn't afford it anymore. And right. people started dropping off and people's lives continue, especially the volunteers, you know? Uh, and so we went through this whole big cycle of just me planning it, having a little person involved, and then it peaked at a really big team mm. and then it petered out. Um, mm. And I'm just fortunate that I have some really great, and as you know, anything that happens like this is, is, is not just me. There's yeah. so many people that, that make it possible. I can't even imagine like trying to compile the right people to make these doors swing open. It's almost like you need to hire a specialist or like a diplomat with mm. relationships that run deep internationally so that you can kind of, um, you know, massage who you have to massage to get these mm. pieces to yeah. go through. Like, I know you had ended up having to pay a lot of bribes. I'm sure those were like, you know, feet on the ground, like, you know, yeah. when you're trying to go somewhere or something like that. But yeah. just the, the, the pure politics of the whole thing is yeah. unbelievable. The politics was difficult. I had um, a company, so I worked out that I could go with a visa company that would get me all of my visas. Uh -huh. And we worked out the, the, the value and it was something like 25, 30,000 pounds of just, just on visas. And then we found this great company called Universal Visas and they said, you know what, we wanna support you, we wanna help you and, and we'll, we'll take all of our fees out of it. And it really helped. Oh, that's great. But they were such a small unit. 
And and when you get little wins like that, you take them and you hold on to them. Mm-hmm. And and Faisal and Maz, who are the, the the kind of the founders of this company, they are still great friends with me now. WhatsApp regularly, and they made everything happen. But it was only because they were working at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday when, on their day off that it was possible. Yeah. Um, and that was the same for everything. <laughs> I honestly, I owe everything to these people. So uh-huh. I've, I I was very fortunate. But um, in terms of bribes and like you say, massaging my way through all of these, you know, when you turn up a, a border, I remember in Chad and I, I didn't have a page free in my passport and I was getting stamps on like the inside page mm-hmm. and all sorts of stuff. And they said, you haven't got any room. We're going to have to charge you. And it was like $400 for a day's entry when it would usually be $20. Just because you didn't have, I didn't have a page, a to blank stamp, page, which is rubbish. You know, that seems, that, um, that's crazy. It, in it, 2019, it, it's it was Chad. a piece of paper. Right? They, he yeah. put the money straight in his pocket, you know, right. it's, um, <laughs> but, but you still have to pay it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and you had to go through like 10 passports, right? Because you're having to send passports to different locations to get them approved for visas and we're waiting on the return yeah. of them while you're also trying to cross other borders. Like, how does that work? Yeah, yeah. so I now travel with two um, and I, I always traveled with one and the other one would be home. So there was uh-huh. always two in, in, in the pipeline. And you can have two, like they allow you to have two yeah. passports? Yeah. I didn't even know um, that. I think it's... I think it's common yeah. amongst lots of countries, but you you have to have a reason for it and you have to ask. And I had a very clear right. reason why I needed it. Um, but then you have problems where you realize that, okay, so I've missed a country because I was ill or because I missed a flight or we've had to redirect for some reason because of a protest. And so I've got a visa in the wrong passport. Now what mm. do we do? You mm-hmm. know, And that happened, I'd say, close to 100 times. Wow. Um, and it was, I had friends and And that's family. when you have to like make the 2 a.m. phone call to the visa people to... Expedite whatever. Yeah, and I'm going to be landing in two hours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And sometimes they say to me, "Well, we can't yeah. expedite it because your passport's in France, or you know, or it's somewhere else, oh or God. and they can't physically do anything because they wow. don't have it." So yeah, it was, it was a logistical, absolute logistical nightmare. Passports is one thing, but then you have the flights just linking up from. You think it's mm-hmm. obvious to be able to just fly from one country to the next, even if you have to go around the houses a bit, but but it really isn't easy. Um, linking up the fourteen Pacific Islands in two, two and a half weeks, two weeks, was nigh on impossible. And when I was speaking to Dean the other day, you know, if he's going to do this quicker, which I believe he will, it's it's going to take some serious, I mean, you're going to have to have private yeah. planes. There isn't a way to do it much quicker. Yeah. He should just hire you. <laughs> you're the well, one person on the planet who actually- well, I, I've talked about- actually, Has experience with this. <laughs> I might be going for a run with him over the next couple yeah. of days. Now I'm here, but- uh-huh. um, I'd love, I really would love to see him do it because I quite like to be an outsider looking at the trip (laughs) so I don't have the stress. Um, Uh, Well, that's very spirited of you. Um, Were there ever countries where you had to kind of skirt the law and just sneak in and get away with it? I mean, I know I had, I've had Charlie Engel on the show a couple of times and he's told stories about, you know, hit their epic, you know, trans Sahara run that they did. And I think they got to, one border, I can't remember what country it was, and they just weren't going to let them in. Mm. And I can't remember how they solved that, but it was another kind of nail biter visa situation. Yeah, Lo- lots of those occasions. And so we had two or three visas that were refused multiple times. Um, so that was Iran, um, Yemen, and Syria, um, off the top of my head. And they were places where you don't just sneak your way in easily. You know, mm. if you say, oh, well, which border do you want to cross that's illegally? Yemen and Syria isn't the yeah. one you'd be pick. Um, and so we did manage to do it all lawfully, but there were occasions where, so for Iran, I went to Kish Island, which is part of Iran, um, but I felt so intimidated there because you were told you can't come. Your visa was refused multiple times and it was only approved through the visa guys. I have no idea how we made it work. And I, I don't yeah. know oh, if, I'm, if I arrive and it's actually valid. Um, but I, I had a moment going through Yemen from Oman, I drove through the night from Oman to get to the Yemeni border. Um, and this guy, my driver, he was lovely, but very dodgy. That's all I can describe him as. He was just appeared and seemed very dodgy. And I was a bit nervous. Um, get, got to the border at two in the morning. And this was about five, five countries from the end. This was so close to finishing. And I realized as we were crossing the border with all of these military personnel, 20 plus armed people surrounding the car, that he was smuggling goods into the country Ugh. and using me as a mule, basically. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, you know, just put these under your seat and just sit on these and don't don't tell them. And here's me spending oh four or five God. years to get to this point of planning and work and effort. And I thought, oh, my word, how has this happened? Um, 
And we were there for a couple of hours. They quizzed us. We had everything out of the car. Um, there was lots of raised voices. And fortunately, they let us through. He, I think, by the, I, I have no idea what they were saying, but by the looks of things, he, he paid them, paid them. Yeah. That's terrifying. It is, yeah. Because you could have just ended up in some yeah. prison somewhere, yeah. th the key thrown away. The government isn't I don't required know what the, to come and get me there. Yeah, there's yeah. No, yeah you're, diplomatically, mm. you would be in a world of hurt. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and I had that feeling a few times. I was locked in an airport um, in Central African Republic um, for a while because I didn't have the right paperwork with me, um, and I didn't have any money to to pay my way through. I'd used all of my bribe money up. You know, I'll travel with thousands of dollars just to use as bribes when I can because you have to, especially going overland borders in Africa. It's, it's it almost feels not like a bribe. It just feels like the dumb thing. It's almost it's a tax. Yeah, it's like giving a tip or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly that. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good way of putting it, actually. Um, and I was tipping heavily, <laughs> right. um, and I ran out of money, and and I just had to wait until the following morning um, to let to for them to let me out of this airport. Wow. And I say airport, it was just a shed, but yeah. So it must have been, I mean, I think people who don't know any better look at what you did and it's all about like, how did you run all these marathons? But like, that's like the easy part. It's so you true. know, it, so it, true. it's just like, oh, it's a relief. All, all, all I have to do today is like run 26 miles. Like, I don't have to worry about all these other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember, you know, I, you know I remember having those, those days uh -huh. in my diary. I, you know, I look at my diary in the morning and it's either flight day or, or run day, uh -huh. um, more or less. Every now and then you get some more time off. Um, Flight day or run day, and when it's a run day, it's just great, you know. Yes, there's sometimes when you're, you're you're terrified to go out and run because yeah. you don't know whether you're going to get attacked or you know it's mugged and all sorts of stuff happened. Um, but you get to that point where your run day is the is the best bit. And obviously, we love running. I'm a runner, um, but then you know you don't have to get on a plane or you don't. You know, I've had some connections which were eight different planes just to get to another country, um, and then you have to arrive and it's two o'clock in the morning yeah. and you have to run. And um, the running bit is just the, the reset. If without the running, I think I would've gone crazy, you know? Was... And with the, you know, logistical problems that were continually arising and mm. flights getting canceled and all of that, I mean, every day lost to some unforeseen circumstance pushes you off your schedule and makes it more difficult down the line to yeah. kind of, you know, complete this thing timely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So a, a there's not a lot of room for error. There was no room. I mean, at yeah. the beginning, we were a bit naive because we thought, yeah, okay, we've we've built we built in about four buffer periods of about ten mm -hmm. days throughout the trip, and we thought, okay, we've got a little bit of time if things go wrong. But then we it dawned on us that we'd use that time far quicker than we than we'd planned. That buffer time had gone right. before we'd got six months. All your in. bonus points are done. All the bonus points are used. And this yeah. is over, just so people understand, this is over like what, 624 days or something like that? 674, yeah. 674 days. So in, in that period of time, you only have 10 days of wiggle room. Yeah. Right. Or Crazy. the whole thing capsizes. It, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and and, and you know that. And that's the right. that's the scary thing. You have you have so little wriggle room. And we had a moment where I was bitten by a dog in Tunisia, one of my first African countries. Tunisia is relatively affluent compared to the other African countries. Um, there's five dogs on the beach. I was running with a friend of mine who came out to support. Um, Andy and I were running along this beach and these dogs just came and and, and, and bit me. Uh -huh. And I thought, it's okay, I've got my rabies jab. I'm only two and a half miles from the end. And I just ran lots of blood pouring down my leg. And I got to the finish and I thought, that's fine, carry on. But I didn't realize that I needed to have top ups for my rabies in subsequent weeks. And where I was gonna be, they didn't have the rabies vaccine readily available. And so it meant rejigging everything. Mm. Um, and that was just, you know, and uh, since then, Following that bite, I was terrified to get bitten again, not because of injury, but because of ruining the trip. Right. Yeah. Well, dogs were a big problem. Yeah, they were. Right? <laughs> they were. In one particular island of note. The Marshall Islands, yeah. absolutely, yeah. So I did lots of, so I call them like the micro states. So you've got, um, most of the Pacific Islands are tiny um, in terms of where the land is. There's lots of land kind of semi in the water, semi, semi out of the water. And you've got Vatican, obviously, Smallest yeah. country in the world, 82 laps I did of St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. And did then, you get like, was there some, with that, was, was there weird permissions? Like, okay, here's the, you just run the perimeter inside I, the wall? I, yeah. yeah, so I tell you what, I, I could have, uh, that could have come unstuck really, really badly quite early on. So Europe was my second phase of the journey and third phase of the journey. And there was a, a security guard who came to me when I was eight miles in and said, you can't run here. 
And it was only by pure coincidence that this security guard was heavily into Kung Fu. And my friend who was filming for me at the time uh -huh. happened to be very heavily into Kung Fu. And they, once again, sport winning, they shared their sport, sporting moments. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to tell anybody. Just get it done. Wow. And how did Kung Fu even come up? I know. I know. And and <laughs> and because uh, I, I, you know, in those situations, you say uh -huh. and you do whatever you need to to, for, to convince them. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm a runner. Like, this is fine. I've done it in all these countries. Please help. And, and you, you asked the question, like, you're a runner, you sport. And he's like, oh. And we got chatting. I tried to be as friendly as I possibly could because uh -huh. you have to be. Um, and it turned out, and I've, I've still got his email address. He was a brilliant bloke because he he could have said no. Yeah. Um, and uh, and we didn't have all the right permissions that we needed, which I thought we had, but we didn't. Um, and I couldn't. He said, "Go to the uh, go to the office, go to the visa office, which is just around the corner." But I couldn't leave because I was eight miles in, and if I'd left, I would have gone out out of the country. Yeah. Um, and so he just he was he was brilliant. So. <laughs> Coming back to those countries, um, very, very small countries. They did 140 laps in uh, Jamaica because of some some gang violence in uh, in Kingston. Um, and then, like you said, the dogs proved very, very difficult everywhere, but especially in the Pacific Islands. And I ended up doing 335 laps of a car right. park in one of the most beautiful places in the world, which uh -huh. turned out to be rather ugly. There's just wild dogs everywhere. They just run after you. Yeah. So and all you need is one, you know, nip on the Achilles and you're toast. Exactly yeah. that. Exactly that. It's the it's the Achilles I was most worried about. Um, you know, if you get bitten in the wrong place and you can kind of soldier on and patch it up, but if it's nipping something that physically stops you from moving at mm -hmm. running pace, then you're screwed. Um, yeah. And I had 20 dogs. I, I actually think it was more than 20, but call it 20 dogs, big dogs, very aggressive. They have a diabetes crisis in the whole of the island because people don't go outside and exercise. These dogs are- Because of the dogs. Because of the dogs. And I arrived in my hotel and they gave me my room key and a stick. And they said, if you go around the corner to the shop, you need to take your stick. And they didn't know I was trying to run a marathon. Right. Um, that's yeah. A, that's, yeah, like how would you have known that? I know, you know right? what I mean? <laughs> Hopefully, every, and I can yeah. tell Dean now, yeah. <laughs> take your stick, Dean, yeah. <laughs> or a taser. Um, and then there was a country where you had to run on a on a like a, a landing strip. Yes, good. Research. Where was that? Tuvalu. Tuvalu, um, one of the most hard to reach countries in the world because um, they have I think there's a couple of flights a week, um, and there isn't any space on the island other than the runway, and so everybody lives on the beach, um, which is rocky, and you can't you simply can't run there. Um, but what to my amazement. Not only was I allowed to run on the runway, a live runway, because they knew when the flights were coming and there wasn't going to be one when I was there, um, but the whole community of this island used the runway as a hub of sport. You know, oh, wow. everybody comes mm. out. It was the most unbelievable sight. Thousands of people on this, and it was the whole country, you know, literally everybody from the country uses this runway. And I've got great videos and photos of people playing volleyball and and uh, and cricket and football, hundreds of different games on this huge mm. couple of mile stretch um, runway. And so um, I was very pleased to to do my a whole mountain. I don't think there's many people. So did you get a bunch of people there who ran with you? Yeah. That. So as yeah, they, yeah. I mean, you know, you start off, you do your first up and down and they kind of look at you like you're a bit nuts. And then once you've done your 15th or 16th time, uh -huh. they really realized that something's going on and um and like yeah everywhere that everywhere was like that people came out and, and ran. which country surprised you the most oh um i think it i would say nearly all of the countries surprised me my preconceived ideas of the countries were nearly all the time completely wrong and that's because of the media it's because of my my brain reading stuff and and taking it as as read taking it as that's what it is um there were some there were some really lovely countries which I didn't expect. So Sierra Leone um, was a really fond favourite of the whole journey. The people there are poor. Um, their health and their the healthcare system is is incredibly poor, um, and yet everybody there was smiling. And we'd had people, you know, women passing me water bottles saying water is life, and they have nothing to give, mm -hmm. and yet they give you their water, you know, and that just amplified. So I think it's very difficult to say which surprised me the most, you know, going to places like Turkmenistan and North Korea, which are incredibly controlled. Mm -hmm. um, but you got the whitewashed propaganda tour in North Korea, right? Yes. Like they, they're just with you the whole time and they're showing oh, yeah. you what they want you to see in the whole thing. Yeah, I yeah. think you have to be incredibly lucky to not get that propaganda yeah. tour. But what I did see was more or less what I was expecting. It was incredibly clean. You know, there's lots of little aspects to stuff that you think, oh, I wasn't expecting that, or, you know, how they all queue in single file in silence in the in the in the underground. Um and and little things like that. But it was more 
on a bigger scale, the, the things that surprise me the most is how the correlation between people that are so lovely and have nothing, mm-hmm. you know, and then I end up spending That's time. That's what you hear time and time yeah. again from anyone and everyone who's traveled to those yeah. types of places. They come back very, very struck by that, yeah. uh, by that truth. Yeah. And yet, and I've said this before on the podcast, we get home and we, you know, we, we forget or we reset. It's so easy to reset. Yeah. And I really try hard not to. Um, but I, I mean, I have, you know, you, you, you get up and you, you, you buy stuff, you go online, you get into your rhythm again. And it's really hard to buck that mm-hmm. trend unless you, I believe, unless you move away or you immerse yourself in it. Um, but there is, there is ways to do that. Um, and I think it's just, it's just be, be more in touch with it. So see it more yeah. and, and read about it more and, and don't necessarily, you know, there's the amount of negativity on the news and sadness on the news from stuff going on. And yes, we need to know about that stuff, but there's also some brilliant things going on in the world that I, I wish people could pay attention to. There should be a positive news channel. <laughs> right, I, I agree with that. But then this conversely, <laughs> con- <laughs> I'm doing my part. Yeah. <laughs> um, conversely, you know, there's certain areas of the world that don't get enough attention for, you know, what's happening there. I mean, Haiti stands out as oh, one such gosh. place, right? Like, yeah. and I know you had an experience mm. there. Yeah, Haiti, Haiti, country number four for me on the trip. It was certainly my first experience of, uh, of poverty. Um, and it was obviously the earthquake there that, that, that killed and, and made a lot of people homeless and orphans. Um, and the violence there really struck me. It was heavily armed people on the streets that were approaching me when I was running. And it was only because I had a guy that was driving behind me at a snail's pace when I was running in humidity to to help me with the water that I realized that there isn't there isn't enough shed. You know, you, you be in places and I'll, I'll see something on the news about some horrendous attack. And I'll call home and say, oh, don't worry, I'm safe. And they'll say, what? You know, we haven't, mm-hmm. he hasn't made it to mm-hmm. our news. And it's thousands of people that have been killed or something in, in a, either a natural disaster or, or by human hands. And um, I feel, yeah, I, 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 you're right. I, there's just not enough of the right media. Yeah. How many of the marathons were sort of sanctioned races versus you just creating your own course? Yeah, um, difficult to say because a lot of the, most of them were my own course, but most of those own courses were turned into races by people that were supporting me there. Oh, so, you wow, know, that's yeah, cool. Exactly, so I would turn up and not have it a was race all, to run. It was pre-planned enough that the people there knew what was going on oh, and yeah. had set something up for you. Yeah, so my plan, my default, uh, plan is to get to the hotel, look at a map, roughly know where I'm going to run, run the distance, get some witnesses along the way, job done. Mm-hmm. But more often than not, as the trip went on, as it, as the awareness grew, um, I was arriving and then met by people and they said, oh, we've got this route for you. These are the water stations. Do you need any other food? This is the media we're going to do. Cool. And it's amazing, yeah. you know, and it happened all over the place. I felt like, you know, I was having my own personal run. And it was yeah. my own personal runs everywhere I went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and... For purposes of legitimizing the world record aspect of this for Guinness, like there's yeah. all kinds of rigmarole that get baked into that, right? Like you got to have multiple GPS trackers and yep. witnesses and things like that. Like I know it's a whole thing. It's a pain. It's yeah. a real pain. Right. And I, they're sticklers. They are sticklers. And people, I guess they should be. Yeah. But, on one hand, I yeah. agree with it, but on the other hand, there is a certain. It's frustrating me because it's kind of trying to fit a you know, a square box into a round hole kind of thing. There isn't the rules that apply for a big two-year multi-trip easily. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the base, I had 11 pages of rules, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how detailed they wanted my, and I agree. And luckily we followed them and it's been a pain. (laughs) And I've had lots of people helping me to make sure we've got those, everything they needed. But, you know, I wore two different brands of watch. So two different like kind of GPS systems. Um, I had a GPS tracker that was just on me that wasn't a running watch. Um, and then we had to get witnesses during the run. Uh-huh. Um, and some of them were hotel stuff. But it's difficult. You know, when you run in, I don't know, in a Portuguese speaking African country, I don't know, 20 months before I finished the trip. Sign this affidavit. It, like, yeah. what you and they, go, they have no idea <laughs> what they're signing. Um, and so <laughs> we've had to get lots of backups, you know, uh-huh. of people I've met in airports or on the plane. I say, can I just get your email just in case, you mm. know, just in case. We have need. they signed off on it now? Or so, what does that vetting process look yeah, like? Yeah, it's long. Um, it's really long. So we need to we need to log the logbook. We need to submit an official logbook with all of the data in. But my logbook is a little bit difficult because along with all of those witnesses and GPS data, we have all the photos and videos. That's mm. 400,000 photos and mm-hmm. 20,000 video clips to show because that's what all metadata and it proves where I was and it helps my cause. And so we're we're in the process of sending the hard drive 
a physical hard drive with everything on that they can then go through and yeah. and decide whether I've, I've done it. So, on. in addition to the visas <laughs> and you know making these flights and all of the travel, you know, yeah. logistical nightmares that were continually plaguing you, on top of all of this. You know, you're traveling to most of these places alone, like more more often than not, right? Yep. This is you. Yep. Um, and you're taking responsibility for making sure that you have the witnesses <laughs> and that you have, you know, your watches are all charged and all of that. Yeah. And you're trying to film this thing for a documentary, yeah. right? You're documenting it for <laughs> a project beyond that. Like, so just the mental headspace, like, okay. Are the SD SD cards wiped and like yeah. where's all the footage and how are you logging that? Like you know, I mean Yeah, yeah. You I mean you've hit I can't imagine, you know, yeah. staying on top of all of that on top of everything else. Yeah, you've you've hit the net. It gives me goosebumps actually yeah. when you hear me say and you when you talk about that. Because I was I'm incredibly proud that I've managed to do that, but I honestly don't know how it happened. You know, mm. the amount of stuff. The watches, you mentioned watches being charged. When you're staying in- You're in some crazy country and they're, you know, they you have the right adapter and all of that kind of stuff, the right? Yeah. The where's amount, the plug? Yeah. And, the, and, <laughs> yeah. and also, even when I'm in places uh -huh. where there is perfect electricity, perfect adapters, you know, I'll get so shattered and I'll have a shower and I'll lie on the, lie on the bed to go to sleep and I'll fall asleep. And I'll wake up at three in the morning thinking, ah, I haven't charged my watches. Because mm -hmm. if I don't charge them, I can't run. And if I can't run, then we're going to have to replan it. And so even little things like yeah. that were a stress. Um, fortunately, I mean, I had my uh, my brilliant uh, assistant and a guy called Veton who who organized a hell of a lot for me and was constantly on my case. Um, but it was the, you know, when you go away with people and you decide whether you want to go left or right or whether you want to do something or not do something, having that sense check with somebody else was difficult not to have it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, should I be running down this street now? Is it safe? You know, should, I haven't got any security in the center of Caracas in Venezuela where it's famous for kidnaps. Yeah. Should I actually go out or should I wait? You know, and having that sense check is, is, is difficult. Um, yeah, like you say, the documentary, filming everything as well. Um, a great friend of mine called Mark Beaumont who cycled around the world, um, has the world record for, the, for cycling around the world. He's, he gave me some great advice before I left and he said, if you if you're filming it, you've got to film all of the stuff that you don't want to film. Mm, you know, yeah. and, and as and as, when you're tired and you just like I just want to run, like I don't I don't need the extra hassle, so, of, like having to document this, and I don't yeah. feel like it right now. Yeah, and even to the point that I was actively aware of how fatigued I was by the fact that my brain didn't want to lift my arm to take a photo. You know, mm -hmm. when you're at the end of a very very long mm -hmm. run and your whole body is depleted and any slight movement is a waste of energy. Mentally, my body was okay, but mentally being able to go, all oh, right, okay, I've finished and do a video and try and convey what you're really feeling when actually I'm thinking about, right, okay, I need to go and get some food now. And, you know, all of this yeah. stuff that goes on. And food, food was this right. whole big other aspect, which which went, um, I mean, I think it was more Take what you can get. Take what you can get and eat it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, always ask for seconds on the planes, even if you don't like it, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. How many flights total? 456. Wow. Um, including the flight home. Yeah. yeah. For, and to put it into perspective, we were, we thought we would do 220. So that gives you an idea of- Doubled. Yeah. From the planning, the ideation yeah. to the actuality. Yeah. 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 Um, it's just so many things went wrong. And I believe we, we planned it as well as we could have with the time that we had and the budget and everything. Uh -huh. But even if you had all the money in the world and all the time in the world to plan this, things go wrong. Mm. Um, and that was why we had so many flights. So we had 450 odd flights, 120 20 visas, um, nine passports on my 10th now. Um, yeah. It was, How was Lebanon? Yeah, Lebanon was, um, when I ran there in Beirut as the official Lebanon marathon that I ran, that was fine. I ran along the coast and it was beautiful. Uh -huh. But I've done that Beirut Mar. I've been to yeah. Beirut twice, so yeah, yeah, yeah I'm familiar it's, with it. Along the Corniche, there, yeah. it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. Right? Yeah, it's beautiful, um, and I like that. The food is great as well. And I, I then had to go back to Lebanon to get into Syria. Mm. And crossing, there was a load of protests quite recently, only a few months ago. Crossing by ground into Syria. Yeah, yeah cross, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Leaving Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, leaving Beirut to go over into Damascus. Um, and the, a couple of days before, no, the, the day before I was due to arrive, I had a call from my dad saying that the tour agency that's supposed to be taking you, tour agency, it's, you know, it's not this big tour company, it's just one man <laughs> one on the ground. Time. Yeah. Um, said that their driver, the driver that he'd hired to take another group of people to the border the previous day had been shot and killed. There was 
I know. There had been a real, all these protests going on. And the problem was the Lebanese plated cars traveling towards the Syrian border or the other way around. And so we had to be careful. To, and I switched cars halfway through the journey mm. in order to not have that danger. Right. Um, and I remember, it, you know, I thought I was, when I did that journey, we made the decision that we're here. We don't have any other time. Let's just go for it. I'll get my head down. Let's hope for the best. Had another driver, obviously, because the, the driver was killed before. Um, and they'd advise me not to do it. And I said, let's just get it done. Um, and I remember asking the driver if I could stop. We, we didn't speak very good English at all. And I said, can I stop? Go for a wee. You know, I need to go for a wee. And he said, not here. We, we, and yeah. he was racing through. Um, and only by pure luck and that we made it. Um, and we switched into the Syrian plated vehicle and, and went through the border. And then how was Syria? Syria was a surprise. Um, the center of Damascus is beautiful and actually much less run down than I was expecting. People are lovely. And by pure fluke, again, this happened so many times where I would be in a position where things would happen. I was running around the stadium in Damascus because it was safe. Mm -hmm. It was very hot and there was lots of cars. And so it was, a, it was a good, easy way to do the marathon. And I had witnesses as well. So it was a win-win. Um, and I ran in Damascus in the stadium. And then a few miles into the run, I was joined by the under-19s national Syrian female football team. Oh, wow. And they were coming to train. Uh -huh. And they saw me run. And they were like, yeah, let's do a few miles with you. Wow. What an amazing thing. And I yeah. had these 20, 25 odd people that were that were all training in their pristine running kit. And it's not something that you think of as, as Syria, you know, and it's, it goes back to those preconceived ideas of, you know, people expecting me to be running in a war zone with bombs going off all around me. Right. But it wasn't right, at all. Right, right. Yeah. Do you think that the experience would have been different if you were American? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I've just briefly said that to Dean as well. Yeah. You know, the, the amount of, um, I'm very fortunate to be born British and not yeah. have those political blockers. Um, but that said, you know, we've colonized, colonized a lot of the world and we've had some, you know, have had some lots of frowns and looks to me, but it's a little bit different. It's, I think, I think it's, it's more hostile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I would imagine. Um, what about Pakistan? Were you able to run outdoors? Yeah, right there. Um, I was a little. I, when I was there, yeah. I was in. You know, they were like, "You can't go outside," and and my host was training for a marathon and lived there. Was a Pakistani national, and he didn't train outside. Or if he he said he would occasionally run outdoors, but he could never go back to the same spot like at the yeah. similar time of day. Like he had to mix it up. Yeah, because of kidnapping I was told, concerns. Yeah, I was told that advice. You know, if I'm doing it, don't don't post my route, don't tell right. people where I'm going to be yeah. just in case. Um, lots of lots of countries are like that. But it goes back to this, people say, how can you sum up the whole journey in one word? And I say people. And this network of people that I had that made it possible was exactly why I really enjoyed Pakistan. I mentioned my old boss, the good boss, Razi. Uh -huh. He was uh, Pakistani, uh, born in Pakistan. And he had a really great friend that used to go to university with in Lahore, a guy called Kabir. And he got on the phone to his friend and said, Nick's coming to Islamabad will you help? Mm. And he did. And I arrived at the airport. He picked me up. He gave me a tour. We went for some dinner. Um, and unfortunately, it was absolute, absolutely torrential rain. And so I was running in about a foot of water, which was uh -huh. that. And I was running down the central reservation of a, of a four-lane highway in Islamabad because uh, it was the only dry place to run, dry-ish place right. to run. Um, but in terms of danger, um, I had Kabir tell me where to be, um, inside knowledge, and it's it, without all of these people, I tell you, it would not happen. You know, mm -hmm. money cannot buy you those connections. Yes, you can get people to 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 be there at the right time and to pick you up and to to, to have a security guard with you. But actually, it's the inside knowledge that that made all the difference. Yeah, I would imagine there were probably options in certain you know dicey countries to do the marathon on like a British military base. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did you ever do that or did you opt to, no, I want to be in the communities? Yeah. I didn't do any in British military bases. I did in Afghanistan. I ran in the UN compound uh -huh. um, in Kabul because we were due to have a, a five armored vehicle escort up into the mountains, um, which was unheard of, but they'd approved it. And then it was retracted because there was a blast uh, and a few people killed in an attack the day before I arrived wow. again. Um, and so incredibly sad. There was lots of gunfire in the evenings when I was there. But it was one of those places that I was in this UN compound and we ran 
we ran around all, all all over the place, and there was some brilliant ultra runners as part of the the UN staff, uh -huh. um, and they supported me, and we ran with. Um, I had a helmet and a, a bulletproof uh, vest um, for some of it. And uh, and I didn't want to leave, you know. You turn up to these places terrified and then you make so many great connections you don't want to leave. And so, yeah, there was a few there was a few mm. compound runs. Like in Jamaica, I ran around the, uh, the high commissioner's compound because there was um, 67 people murdered the weekend I was there through gang violence what? in Kingston, right where I wow. was. Um, and, you know... They weren't going to kill me, but I might have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, and so there's lots of things like that which you don't plan. You know, go to Jamaica, you think of beaches and rum and cocktails, and but stuff like this happens all over the place, yeah. and so you have to be a little bit wary. What did the kit look like? Like, what was the bag? <laughs> you know, that you were hauling around? Did that change as you figured things out? And yes. I, I I suspect you started with more than you needed, and then <clears throat> as you got your footing. That's that it was, that that it was that piece bit, of luggage got a little bit smaller. Absolutely, it was a bit like <laughs> it was a bit like a bell curve. Actually, uh -huh. I started with a a bigish pack, a rucksack. I was traveling around the world. Take a rucksack. That makes mm. sense. But everything was just difficult to get into it. I had far too many things. Um, skip ahead to the end, and I was traveling with a tiny, tiny bag with like one pair of pants, one pair of socks, and just wash like mm. showering in my clothes and washing them. And as I went on, well, that's the good thing about running. Yeah, yeah. So it's, one it's, pair of shorts. You're wearing your shoes already. Yeah, you know. I tell you that, and I'm still. I still have them with me right now because I'm going for a run later today. The pair of shorts that I wore all the way through, um, my kit sponsor, which I'm wearing, Do Sport Live. They um, they gave me some shorts, and I wore them for every single run. And it has a bite mark out of the back where I was uh -huh. bitten by the dog, and I still wear them <laughs> to this day. So you're absolutely you right. You're gonna frame those. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna frame them. We might auction them or something. I don't Just know. Just a little but... Bronner soap, and you're good. You yeah. Know? They're, they're they're pretty disgusting. I think I think the frame would I think the yeah. frame would work. And they're really um they're sun you know right at the 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 waistband they're black and as they go down because it's been so sun sun bleached they're basically close to white now. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, my my kit went my kit went up and down, but um, I also had a bit of a problem with um, souvenirs. People used to give me brilliant stuff mm. like medals with my faces on, trophies made by brilliant sculptors and all sorts of stuff. I didn't have anywhere to put it. And so I ended right. up having actually traveling with a souvenir bag because I didn't want to have to say no to mm. this opportunity to, to take something. Yeah, and you want to have that yeah. stuff. It's cool. Um, what about the camera equipment? I mean, was this this iPhone or GoPro or like how were you documenting it? Every bit of camera equipment that's ever been made, <laughs> not quite. Mm. I've I traveled with a lot. Um, I travel with some decent lenses for some. I love my photography, and we're releasing this photography book. Um, and it's just a hobby, but I believe I'm okay at it, and I'm passionate about it. And so I traveled with a lot of photography lenses just for taking photos for but, like DSLRs, like full blown, full blown, yeah, like three heavy, kilo, yeah, right, big lenses. So you're running with that stuff too. Um, sometimes. It, if I had a, so frequently I'd have a car or a motorbike or a cyclist that would support me. Uh -huh. um, and so they would have it in right. the car behind me. And then if I see something I want to take a picture of, this is a group of kids or something, you know, I, I'd take the picture. But sometimes I, I, I wore my backpack and, um, and, and I ran. Um, Osprey gave me these really great running backpacks, which were quite a bit bigger than the, like the other ones, the Salmon mm -hmm. ones. And so they, they do fit the cameras. Um, but then GoPros, I had three GoPros. Um, I had my drone, which was confiscated many, many oh, times. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all my batteries. Um, I had, I think I had- you fly a drone in Syria? No, I didn't. I didn't take it to Syria. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'd have got close. <laughs> yeah, um, but it was it was it was confiscated a few times. Yeah. Cuba, most places in Africa don't like it. Um, Haiti was another one. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I traveled with lots of it, and and it was uh, a lot of it was stolen actually in China. Um, and I didn't realize it had been stolen, but my bag, when it went through the airport, um, they decided that I wasn't allowed the camera equipment, and so put a nice letter in my bag. It all in Chinese, which I couldn't read, um, which I assume says we've taken your stuff, um, and wow. I, I never got that back. So wow. we had to kind of did you lose. did you have footage in there that you lost then no. too, or just the equipment? Very careful yeah. with the footage. The footage was always backed up immediately. Right. So yeah, you gotta you gotta finish the marathon, get to the airport, <laughs> back up the footage, you write know. my blogs, <laughs> oh my <laughs> tell God. people what yeah. I'm doing, make sure that the the onward. Yeah, because you did a great job of chronicling the thing in real time on Instagram with beautiful photographs and yeah, and thanks. Stuff. I think so. My my Instagram and I'll plug it. It's Nick Butter Run. Nick Butter Run. I I I posted it because there's no point. You can't do it after the fact. Right. You know, I can't spend the following two years doing it. But it was difficult, and people would often mail me or email me or message me and saying, "Are you alive? We haven't heard from you in a day." 
It's like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm mm. in the Central Africa. I'm in the Congo. Like, <laughs> I haven't got easy Wi-Fi. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, connectivity was another another big thing. Trying to check in with people and my sat phone being broken sometimes and um, being able to actually write my blogs, write everything on Instagram and remember it because I was writing notes as well, hand notes for my book because there's stuff yeah. that you want to remember that isn't, you know, I can't fit in a, in a small, small space in an Instagram right. post. So uh, it's it, overall, you know, you get an idea of the scale of the trip. It's um, It was the most amazing feeling to finish, but I... I feel like I want to go back. It's almost like a big recce, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back and see more of each place. There's a cool, like, sizzle reel film on your website mm. that, you know, basically gives you an idea. Yeah. It's kind of very, you know, quick cuts yeah. of all these different places. It reminds me a lot of um, Casey Neistat's Do More Thank video. You. It's yes. very it's very much yeah. in that style of, like, it's so hectic and chaotic and there's so you're just being bombarded with the stimulus of so many different cultures. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah, no, we like those videos. I was very fortunate, Spark Media put that together. They um, came to me before the trip and said, you've got to do a documentary uh-huh. and we'll help. And I said, well, I can't put any money towards a documentary right now because we're spending everything on and everything else. And they said, don't worry, you know, we'll just we'll just help you put it together. And and they are now producing the, the final yeah. documentary. Right. Yeah. How many hours of footage did you come we home have with? 20,000, we have, I think it was 18 terabytes, 20,000 yeah. video clips. So I have no It's idea. a tough edit because, you know, it can't be 196 episodes, you know, like how do you craft a, a cohesive narrative out of such an epic journey without it yeah. being repetitive. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of people would say, well, I ran here, then I got on a plane, then I ran here. <laughs> yeah. You know, but for to me it wasn't like that. You know, it was it's basically going from one problem to the next mm. and just 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 articulating in a, a relatively linear narr- narrative of this is what happened. Um, but the way that we're doing it, it's a, a parallel narrative. We have lots of interviews with my family and friends and team, mm-hmm. and that's interspersed throughout the right. throughout the, the documentary. But um, it's the same when writing the book. You know, my book, and I'm plug it as well because it's on it's on Amazon. Plug away. It's on Amazon. It's called Running the World. Um, it's coming out later this year, but there's no. It didn't seem to be a specific release date. No, because right I now. need to finish it yeah. first. Rich. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem, and it, it leads me into. I've written almost the word count for this book. And I'm only in chapter two. Mm. <laughs> you know, how can I cut stuff out? It's it's. Yeah. Yeah, I want I want people to see the whole journey. It's it's really difficult. Well, I think you your first pass needs to be overwritten. You know, get it all yeah. down, and then you have this big piece of clay that you can chip away at. You're completely you know, and right, yeah. and and it's so fresh. I mean, you just finished this thing to get it. I think it's important imperative for you to get it all down on paper yeah. as soon as soon. possible, and then you have something to work with. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and I'm spending the next few days running, writing, running, yeah. writing until I go home to <laughs> to more more stuff. But it's um, yeah, I love it. I, I'm a very, very privileged position to be in, to be able mm. to, to moan about having to write, you know, difficult to write yeah. the book on a, on no, a it's cool. trip of a lifetime. Um, on a very practical level, like how, you know, how is the process of, of, you know, lining up all of this sponsor support and kind of, you know, making sure that you're serving them as well. I mean, this is a, re- these are relationships, right? Yeah. Like you, like they're not just giving you money. You have to be, you know, a, a good ambassador for these brands. And I mean, you have like 46 brands yeah. or something like that yeah. supporting you, right? Yeah. I would imagine it would have been, it seems to me it would have been a lot easier. You just have like one huge company comes in, Visa, Nike, whatever it is, we're writing you a huge check and you just, you're, you know, you have yeah. one company, but you're yeah. having to work with tons to kind of cobble this whole thing together. If, if you can write to, to Branson for me, that would be great, Rich. <laughs> okay. um, no, we, 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 we did- Come on, we, Richard. <laughs> yeah, please. Well, you've done it already now. You can just back pay me. So. <laughs> no, it's- um. You're right. Having that many sponsors is difficult, but fortunately, there's very, very few of them that have any formal commitments. And they're people that have come out the woodwork and said, look, we want to help you. Mm -hmm. We don't expect much, but what you can give, we'll be grateful for. And I think on paper, you say 46 sponsors. We've got now, I think it's 50, just under 50. Um, And I think a lot of the outside world would see oh, it's just a load of money that people are giving you. Mm -hmm. I spent 90, I'd say, let's try and get this right, 85, 82% of the trip, that kind of number Uh was paid by me and my family. The rest of it, you know, a lovely, lovely brand would give me some socks. Right, that's and great. Great, but it doesn't doesn't do anything else. And I, yeah, I need socks, but I I need, (laughs) I need, 
five hundred bucks because I don't have a page on my, you know, my passport to get stamped here. Ex yeah. Exactly that. And when you're you're wasting, you know, getting into Bhutan cost us fourteen hundred dollars just because it's a you know, it's a difficult to actually. Mm -hmm. I need an invite, so you have to basically pay for it. Um, and so, actually, funding the trip um, has to be in the top two or the top three of the hardest thing to do. Um, and I sold virtually everything. Um, my parents and my family gave up a lot of money, loaned me a lot of money. Um, and at the sold time, all those suits. So, yeah, I actually did. Did you? <laughs> um, there's a lot of a lot of shirts that went to charity shops as well because I, I thought I've got so many shirts. Um, the irony being is I now need a shirt to uh, to wear when I do my theatre tours. <laughs> um, no, I. You're absolutely right. I, I stripped my life back. I now live in a van. Um, I live in a van and I travel around doing my speaking tour all over the world with just trying to share the journey. And it, I wouldn't change it for the world. And had I had hundreds of millions of pounds to spend, the trip wouldn't have been the same. Mm. And I wouldn't have felt so invested and so pressured. And all of the feelings were amplified by having everything on the line. You know, being told I wasn't going to do this six weeks from the end after having everything in my basket. Mm. You know, I hadn't not left anything out. It's that motivation. You know, people say, so what gets you out of bed in the morning when it gets tough? That's one of them. Yeah. You know, I think I read that the total cost of the endeavor was in excess of like 500,000 pounds. Yeah. Something more like than that. that. More than that. Yeah. I would think it would be more than that. It was, it was, yeah. But, but I mean, it's, we haven't actually done the final numbers yet because uh -huh. there's a lot of stuff that we're still paying. Um, it, I would say it was, it was close to, more close to a million. Yeah. Um, but, that kind of money, you know, there's great friends of the family that I haven't seen for years who just put their hand in their pocket and said, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll give you we'll give you a few grand. Um, and that made all the difference at the right time. Um, well, if it makes you feel better, uh, you know, a decent documentary budget is about a million. Yeah. So. Maybe. <laughs> that was the budget of the documentary that you're making. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. You just, you that's just a, had to do a few other things along the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. a very good point. That's a very good way of looking at it. I was yeah. just investing in a documentary. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, Come on, Spark. It's all on Spark now, <laughs> it's all on Spark. right? Um, no, we've got we've got some good connections with the documentary. I, I'm I'm very privileged, and I I feel like I just want to go and 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 physically. I cannot. I cannot tell you how thankful I am of people. I almost get emotional thinking about it. The amount of people that have come out. Just, you know, a lovely lady called Rowena. Um, she was listening to the radio before I started and she lived in Spain. She's British, lived in Spain. And she said, come and stay with me. I stayed with her, put me up in a beautiful home in Barcelona. She then drove me to two other countries wow. because she wanted to help. And it's that selflessness of people from all over the world that made the journey. And I, I just want to encourage everybody I speak to in this upcoming tour to, to help, to like, to realize that your people around you are everything that make the world good. Yeah. Without people, the world would be beautiful, but it wouldn't be as fun. What are some of, I mean, you, you, you just kind of said it, but you know, the, the takeaways and the lessons. Yeah, I think the, the, the takeaways, A, never um, try and remove those preconceived ideas from countries um, more. And I really mean it more like 95% of the time I was away, it wasn't exactly how it was portrayed in, in all of the, whether it was a, a guidebook or whether it was a travel magazine or, you know, you compile all of this stuff of how you believe a country is going to be. And unless you visited it, it's, it's, it's not the same. So now what is it like when you turn on international news and you see some report from some place that you've been? Well, first thing I do is text my mates there and say, are you okay? More often than yeah. not, that's the, the, the real reason. And then I get the response back of, yeah, it's fine. It's not actually as bad as they're saying, or it is bad or, you know, and there's, when I see CNN, for example, lots of big disasters from all over the world, or BBC World News as well, um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be talked about. And I believe that by focusing on some of the negative stuff, it actually creates positive stuff because people then come and help. But I wish there could be the follow-up stories of this mm -hmm. is now what's happened in the in the wake of a disaster or the wake of something happening. Um, because, it, because people need to see that as well. So um, I guess the other big thing is coming right back to the beginning message that Kev taught me, which is not waiting for not waiting for something to happen in your life to kick you up the backside to do something. You have an opportunity to do it now. Um, and whether you're 10 years old or 80 years old, you probably have something that you want to do mm -hmm. and you have an opportunity to do it. Even if you, like me, can't afford it, wasn't fit enough really. Um, and so just just go for it. And, and Kevin, you know, who you met, what year was it that you did Marathon to Solve? 15, 16, 15. 16, 15 yeah. um, was... Diagnosed with basic, I mean, basically a life sentence, right? And now yeah. it's five years later. 
Yeah, five Still years alive. and 40 days, something like that. Yeah. Um, did yeah. he join you in Athens? Yeah, it yeah. was uh, incredibly moving. We had a lot mm. of tears during that run and uh, had some laughs and some really lovely chats. So Kev, Kev was 49 when he was diagnosed, given terminal prostate cancer, given as little as two years to live. Um, and he, dry, he describes it at the moment as drug roulette. So he's basically taking his drugs and one day they'll stop working. And maybe there'll be another drug that works and maybe there won't. Mm -hmm. And it's that day that comes that we don't want to happen, you know, when when he'll drop off a cliff. But and, and you know, and his meds will stop working. But five years on, um, he's still with us and he still will die from cancer. He was absolutely riddled with it. And I just wish that we could get the message out there. So I suppose this is a, a big, a big message of mine that I'm gonna probably be preaching around the rest of my life is that if you are a man and you're over 40 years old and you haven't gone and got your prostate checked, you have to do it because you could have prostate cancer with no symptoms and you could be literally dying any day. That's the reality. If you don't get checked and you catch it late, the chances of you dying are huge. If you catch it early, the chances of you living are huge. And so, and also if you're not a man or you're not over 40, the chances are you know somebody who is. Mm -hmm. um, and so- I, yeah, It's I, the I, most common form of cancer for men, right? Yeah, biggest, yeah. it's actually, well, it's overtaken breast cancer now, so it's the biggest, biggest- oh, really? cool, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's overtaken breast cancer, and breast cancer's obviously had a lot of um, public awareness and funding. Um, and I just feel like it's now time to turn our heads and, and look at this cancer that's now killing a lot of men. Twelve, just over twelve thousand men die from prostate cancer in the UK alone. That's every forty-five minutes. So you you uh, use this adventure to also raise funds for. Prostate Cancer UK, right? Yes, Prostate how Cancer I, how UK. Much, how much money did you guys raise? We, we um, on the Just Giving page, I'll have to check it. I think we're up about 125, but I know we've got a substantial offline that's gone in. So I believe it's just over the 200,000 pound mark. We uh -huh. wanted to raise 250 and I think we will. Um, hopefully with when the book and the documentary comes out and with my... So that's like ongoing. Speaking to it. It, oh, it's right. ongoing. I, and I, I won't stop until I know that that yeah. target is in the bank, you know, because right. it... it there's no reason why we can't do that. It's just it just takes everybody that's listening to this and everybody that's listening to the things I'm going to say in the future just to a dollar, uh -huh. or fifty cents, a pound, whatever it is. Just a small amount really makes a difference. And that money that we're raising is specifically going towards a national screening program, and so that means that men can get access to free and easy uh, checks right. um, without having to go through this whole ordeal. And um, and I hope we'll then have enough money to combat the stigma attached to prostate cancer and the fact that people don't want to talk about it because it's embarrassing, which it shouldn't be. <laughs> really? I didn't even know. Is yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because pe people, mm. men especially, don't want to talk about it because it involves your bum. Yeah. That's the reality. Right. Um, and it shouldn't It shouldn't be the case because it's killing people. And yeah. so I, I'm convinced that if it, was, if it involved a different part of your body, they wouldn't be killing as many right. people. So you've got this speaking tour yeah. coming up. Has yeah. that already started or you're on the cusp of that? Well, yeah, I saw Dean just the other right. day speaking in, uh, in the National Running Show in the UK. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's kind of started, but it's ramping up properly starting in March. Um, and it's like a full, like I looked at the schedule, like it's, there's a lot of dates all yeah. over the UK. All over the UK. And we're now starting to do some in the US as well. Mm. Um, and what I've got planned in the future will bring me to North America. And so I'm hoping that if people enjoy, hopefully people enjoy what I'm saying and we'll, we'll take something from it in the UK and then I can I can then do more in the US. Uh, and what's the, what's the message? Message when you get up in front of kids or schools or these groups at these theaters? Yeah, the, I think the message is to, A, there's there's a big message of resilience in this whole journey, right? You know, overcoming the stuff that you think uh -huh. you can't do. And you know, when you get out of bed in the morning and it's raining and you think, oh, well, I can't go for a run, it's cold. You know, yes, you can. Like there's there's, uh, there's other stories behind it, but the overarching messages of, of time. So I preach about this number of 29,747, uh -huh. which is the average amount of days that a British person will live for. 29,747 is the magic number. And I want people to realize that that number is going down every single day and we have an opportunity to, li to live our life right now. Um, in, in the UK alone, we spend on average nine years of our life watching TV and we spend 90% of our life indoors. And so I'm, I'm basically standing up and preaching about the fact that like, Yes, okay, you need to earn money to feed your kids and pay your mortgage, but you also have an opportunity and a responsibility to enjoy and to live your life as passionately as you can with the stuff that you love, because otherwise it's going to be too late. You know, you're going to get to your deathbed and not have done what you wanted to do. Yeah. So, When I look at what you've done, one thing that strikes me is, <clears throat> is that 
you just basically made this decision to do this. Like you, you became a runner later in life. Yeah. It wasn't like you were out winning races, no. winning bad water and marathon to sob. Like you were, oh, yeah. you are an enthusiast and obviously you have a certain amount of talent and dedication because it's hard to run these, these ultras. But the thing is like, it's not like you were a name in no, running and, no. and you just took it upon yourself to do this thing that nobody else had ever done yeah. and you figured it out. Yeah, that's and it, I think it's easy, out. like people, oh, he was a banker and he was, you know, I was like, oh, maybe he had a million dollar bonus that he just paid for this thing, but Very that's not, not the not case like at all. No, not the yeah. case at all, not the case at all. And you're right, I'm not a fantastic runner. I, like you said, ultra runners say that, but I'm really not. I'm not even that fit, I'm not even that healthy. You know, I, I literally <laughs> just wanted to go and live by what Kev said is to enjoy it and to travel mm -hmm. and to run. And, um, and I'm gonna continue to run because it's, it helps with my mind, with my everything that I have in my life. So it's uh, running, I, I describe as just very much my mode of transport. Um, and it happens to be a, a cheap, was a cheap and easy way of, uh, of getting around until you decide to run around the world, of course. Right. <laughs> and I think it was funny as I, I was reading some of the media on you um, and, and, and it seemed like journalists were were shocked that you still like to run. Like, oh, this is <laughs> like, now, yeah, you're like, you're like, I want to get back to running now that people are like, what? You know? <laughs> it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. I don't really understand what that question I get is. So what are you going to do next? Well, I'm obviously going to, I'm going to run. Like, uh -huh. I'm not just going to stop. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I get the point of, I've run so much now, do you want to stop? But I'll tell you what I am not missing, which is getting on and off planes yeah. or having that long snaking queue in airports to get to immigration. Um, but no, running is like you, like yourself. It's um, it's it's great for if you love it, you carry on doing it. Obviously, is there a bit of a a coming down from such a mm. you know huge experience? I haven't experienced it yet. I think things have been kind of niggling me in the background, like stuff that I I've missed that I didn't realize I was missing. Um, like meeting new people all the time. Yeah, you know, I was meeting new people and making friends every couple of days. And then having this great relationship with them and then having a chat with them on WhatsApp for the following weeks. And now I, I'm very much in the zone of, yeah, okay, I'm still meeting people in theatres and I'm, you know, talking to new people. But it's uh it's not as intense. And it was that was quite a special two year bubble of my life. Um but I think the a lot of people did say, oh, you're going to have to prepare yourself when you come back because it's going to be a, this but I've just filled it. I've just filled this gap with yeah. being busy and writing the books and getting the document, documentary out and, and doing the tour. And I think once that stuff starts to die down and I've finished the book and I've compiled all the photos for the photo book and I've w witnessed the documentary come and go and it starts to fade a little bit, then maybe, but other stuff will take its mm -hmm. place. Yeah, I think that's healthy. You know, yeah. I, there's a, I know a lot of people who they do some really super crazy thing and then they feel like they just have to keep upping the ante or yeah. doing something crazier. And, you know, it's a, that's an addict mentality because you, yeah. it's like chasing the dragon, right? Yeah, like so you've, did, you've done this incredible thing and much like I would imagine, you know, a soldier returning from a deployment, like there's an adjustment period yeah. because you've gone from a very extreme situation, not to compare, you know, running marathons to being in battle, but no, no. the idea of being yeah. in, in, in something that's, that's not of the normal life that is intense. very heightened and intense to then being sort of sitting in the countryside and, and having to adjust to that, right? And there's yeah. this, this wanderlust or this itch like, you know, I need that dopamine rush again. Mm. And I think people get into trouble with that. But to the extent that you can kind of leverage the experience that you've had and the kind of platform that you've created for yourself to then take that, whatever that energy is and, and pour it into being of service to other people, I think you'll find great yeah. fulfillment in that. Yeah, I hope so. And what I've what I've got next is still running and it's I've just slowed everything down and we're mm. gonna go, um, the, the plan is to do something similar. Um, but to enjoy it more, not focus on a record or time, um, and to basically write more, take more photos, and uh, and really, yeah, I suppose just immerse myself in what I'm doing. And what I hope to do is to run, go and run, set another record, just because it's not been done, by running a marathon in all of the national parks in North America. Oh, that's cool. Because exactly, it's cool, yeah. it's beautiful. Um, and I've got, rather than doing three a week, the schedule that we've roughly planned, and I've been thinking about it for a while, even during the last trip, was uh, it's about 10 days. So every 10 days I'll do a run 
and I'll that, I'm then breaking it down to do some school talks and to do some other corporate work, but also just travel around in the van. Um, I'm getting a puppy in three days' time, by the way. Oh wow! Um, and so the puppy right. will start to run with me, um, and uh, and then get go over to the US in in January 2021. Um, and start trekking across to all the national parks, tick them off over 500 days, mm -hmm. and then go up to Canada and do another 500 days to tick off all of the other national parks. Only one border crossing. Easy, yeah. easy. And, and I hope I'm not going to have to pay any bribes to get into Canada either. <laughs> you never know. I was uh, kind of living in the headspace of Ricky Gates over the last couple of days because he's the most recent episode that I just put up mm -hmm. and, and have spent quite a bit of time thinking about his cross country, you know, unsupported run across America, yeah. which has parallels to what you've done, but but which is also a very different animal because he he's somebody who, you know, whether it's running every street in San Francisco or running hmm. across America, like these are ultra endurance events, but they were really about taking your time and and connecting deeply with your community and yeah. your natural environment. And Yours is different in the sense that you're popping in, you're running these marathons, you're having an, you know, a, a valuable experience with the people and the landscape when you're there, but then you're out, yeah. right? It's yeah. very rapid, yep. rapid fire. Too rapid, yeah. too rapid. And, and certainly for anybody that does this kind of thing or the same thing again in the future, whether it's Dean or otherwise, you, I wanted more time everywhere. And you add one yeah. one day to every country, that's another nine months, you know? That's the, that's the kind of length of, you can't add <laughs> yeah. another day. Um, yeah. But slowing things down for 196 <laughs> extra days. Extra to, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's intense. And I, what I'm doing in the future is, is just slower and I want to take time to look around and enjoy what I have. Mm -hmm. And I also, I'm looking to get into a bit of learning about the environment because of you know our big problem in the West mm -hmm. is the environment, despite the fact of you know, all the other problems going on in the world. I wanna just learn a bit about it and, and start to use the trip over those 1000 days um, to, to learn and to hopefully share what I then have, you know, I can come back and see you in a few yeah. years time and say, well, this is what I now know. Cause I know virtually, I don't know nothing about the environment cause I had to do lots of offsetting projects for my trip um, to make our whole journey carbon neutral. And so this next thing I'm trying is, is to learn a bit, to share the journey of this trip as well um, and hopefully get other people into, into sport. Let's talk about the carbon offset thing. Yeah. That's that's interesting because yeah. there is <clears throat> there is this thing like oh it's very self indulgent. You took four hundred and yep. forty five flights and God knows how many you know yeah. car rides, et cetera. Like the yeah. how do you offset? I mean that's a massive Project. carbon footprint to Huge. offset. Yeah. So we um, I was trying to find companies that were going to be able to help me offset, and I think the standard. Standard one that everybody jumps to is when you're offsetting carbon emissions, you plant a tree. You know, that's the mm -hmm. that's the obvious go-to. But there are many, many other ways to do that. And using the carbon credits model, which is so through this company called Natural Capital Partners, they very kindly replied to my one of many, many emails and said, yeah, we'd love to help you. And they sponsored my offset by giving me four projects in which we would do various different environmental work. So to use an example, Guatemala, which was also one of my favorite countries, is a, is a company there um, called uh, Ecofiltro, and they do water filtration, and they also create uh, f stoves which require less wood, uh -huh. and therefore the people that are cooking on these stoves then have to use less wood, and then the smoke is less, and so they get ill less, and it's also cutting down less trees, if that right. makes sense. And so what this company does, and they, you know, they, they're a very, very big company for lots of multinationals all over the world, and they said, we've put all of your, they even asked me about my diet, you know, what kind of what kind of diet I had and how many planes we'd be taking and how many, uh, and they gave me the certificate with, which was offsetting 45 tons of carbon emissions. Mm. Um, and we're currently in email discussion about upping that just to make sure we're completely covered with everything. So 45 tons was offset, which was CO2 equivalent. And that means that all of these so we had four projects around the world. This one in Guatemala was one of them. And not only does it help the environment, but it helps the communities of people in in in, in country. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I don't know if it's a perfect system, but I think it's a, a much better way than just planting trees. That's for sure. Yeah. One of the places of the, in the world that I that I know so little about that it's embarrassing is Africa. Mm. 
I, I think it's the same for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I believe I know a bit now. Um, but what I have seen, I, I liken, I suppose this is, it may, it may sound silly, I don't know, but I liken Africa similar to the US in the sense that we've got 50 states and 54 countries in Africa. And they're very much governed differently, different laws, mm -hmm. different rules, different attitudes, different races, different religions. Um, it's just that Africa currently is less well off. But if you were to read books like a great book called Factfulness about how the kind of environment and the, and the, the culture of wealth is, is, is shifting um, to Asia and to Africa, you'll start to see that Africa is booming. It will boom. It's not a case of, oh no, they can never be a, a civilized society. Africa is A, beautiful, but B, has so much potential. And so in terms of the, the, the climate and everything that's going on there, I had, a, I think it was an average temperature of 44 degrees C mm -hmm. in those 54 countries. It was hot. Yeah, what is that? Like, that's over 100 Fahrenheit. Yeah, absolutely scorching. Um, and some places, you know, deserts uh, don't have don't have rain for, for very long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And then you, you learn about all of this, and then you go to somewhere like the Pacific Islands, which are actually directly under threat from rising sea levels, um, which I also learned, which, you know, is, is also about the, the the salt water membrane in these islands and how the uh -huh. water is rising and ruining the... So there's, there's all sorts of elements, but I tell you what, if I could tell anybody to go and visit any continent and spend some time, it would be in places like Sierra Leone uh, and Togo and the Congo, yeah. um, where, where people live very, very differently. What about Antarctica and the Arctic Circle? Yeah, good point. Good mention it. Well, I definitely didn't need to do any running in the North Pole because there isn't any land. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just right. a lot of frozen water. <laughs> um, but in Antarctica, technically um, co-owned by seven different countries. Um, and so it's not technically a country. Didn't need to do it. Mm. But it's, it's, it's one of the seven continents. Mm. Right. You know, I've got to do it. And so I was talking with a few friends recently about um, what I could do. Uh, and I'd love to run in in both the poles, some something substantial. Um, but then I have the conflicting interest of the climate, you know, and the environment. Yeah. And should I be should I be traipsing through these places that are delicate and and maybe should be more protected? I don't know. Yeah, it's an interesting mm. uh, thought experiment because. In terms of offset, like if you can create, a, a, you know, an adequate amount of awareness that creates some kind of action in the wake of it, does it become, you know, a rational thing to do? Yeah. And your guess is as good as mine. And how will you yeah. know until you've done it? And is it right. worth taking the risk? And um, I, I mean, as a, as a tourist, as a a human of the planet, I'd love to see both the poles and to properly witness them and do a brilliant expedition. And yes, I would love to plan them, but I don't want to... We're in a quite a delicate balance with with the with the climate, so I, I don't know what how I'll feel about that after mm -hmm. learning. You know, I've talked about this learning period over the next few years when I do this next trip. Um, I might completely change my mind and go completely green yeah. in, a, in a different way. I don't know. How's the diet? We can start there. We can start there. We can have a conversation we? about that right now. My diet and your diet are probably the opposite. <laughs> uh, no, I I'd love and I will. To get closer and closer to to the lights of your diet, uh -huh. I have. I'll leave you with a couple books. P yeah, please yeah. do, please do. I no, I'm. I'd love to. So throughout this whole uh -huh. trip, these two two years, I actually thought about being vegan through it, through the trip, and I'm so glad I didn't because I think I would have starved. Because yes, there's obviously that. You're not going to start. It would have been. Thinking. It would. Have, it would have added. You know, so a lot much more pressure. complexity to it. Although I think you know, in a lot of you know less developed parts of the world, you know, they you know a lot of vegan food is pauper food. It's you know, it's rice and beans and yes. grains and things like that. Like you know, especially you know, I've traveled all over the Middle East. Like that's like the best vegan food. Oh I've yeah, had anywhere easy, like yeah, places it's, where you think, oh, it's going to be so hard, and it's not hard at all. No, but, and I don't know enough. Yeah. I don't know enough as I should to make kind of informed decisions. And there's also the occasion, I mean, many, many times when you arrive in a country at two in the morning and the only thing next door to you is a yeah. chicken house or, you know, a fast fast food place. Um, and if I go anywhere else, then I'm at risk of either getting into trouble yeah. or getting lost or getting attacked or whatever. Um, and so I think I've made a lot of excuses why I shouldn't do that. Um, but maybe by the time I see you next... Um, I, you're my you're my new project. Yeah, please, Rich, do it. <laughs> well, here I was like, 
<laughs> looking at some of the stats on your run. So uh, on 22 of the marathons, you had food poisoning. On four of them, you had kidney infections. Yeah. You did 101 marathons on an empty stomach. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, 22 marathons with food poisoning. Horrible. Oh, my word. Um, the amount of days I woke up and literally would just crawl out of bed to the bathroom to then vomit and then get my gear because on. Because of the water to something you ate in a strange land? Yeah. yeah. Um, a combination of everything. I think it was um, a knock-on effect of not having enough water. So, for example, in Iran, I didn't have water for 24 miles. It was 40 mm. plus degrees. And I was urinating blood by the end. Yeah. I was peeing blood. Wow. Um, and I'd had that several times. But in Bangladesh, the humidity was huge and... Had I, so I had a kidney infection and food poisoning in, in Bangladesh, 40 odd degrees, and I was literally throwing up every single mile. Wow. Um, and you just, you know, you think I'm going to just give this was one Was that the mix. hardest marathon? That one and uh, Kuwait or Djibouti. Djibouti in Africa was mm. scorchingly just because hot. because of the heat. Yeah. Just, and, you know, I was, I was trying to cover up as well to kind of be respectful in these places and it, you just end up absolutely yeah. roasting. Um, I remember sheltering in a place in Djibouti, which was this tiny, tiny shed of a, of a restaurant. And uh, the aircon unit they had there, which was a huge aircon unit, was cooling the room to 32 degrees C. <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it was so, so hot, even indoors. Uh -huh. um, and so those temperatures were about it. Yeah, lots and lots of food poisoning. Um, and it got very much like, okay, so I was used to it. I took yeah. lots of supplements to try and help, like probiotics to help my gut and stuff. But, you know, when you're out on a run and you need to drink from a tap in somebody's garden because you're thirsty, it's... I would imagine you got a lot of shots too before you... Yeah, every, every this, you literally know. everything you can right. have. Um, and that took, I think it was three months to get everything. Uh -huh. Um, and then I was more or less done. And I had to have a couple of backups the following year in, into year two yeah. of the trip. But um, that was fine. I, I, got, I felt a little bit ill and I had, I think it was 200 and something days on anti-malarials, which made right. you feel rough anyway. In, in certain Muslim countries, running in shorts, no bueno. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Um, and there was lots of places where I would turn up and assume that that was the case. And then I would ask in reception whether it was fine and they'd kind mm -hmm. of give me the look as if to say you idiot like right. of course you can, of course you can wear whatever you want and then in other places it was the opposite you know where i assumed it would be okay and it wasn't um but then did that cause problems uh it, it yeah I, i'd had a um a, somebody threw a a, wa a water bottle at me out of the window um, which was full and it hit me and it hurt, but it wasn't damaging me, but they, they right. were honking. What and, country and was that? I, it was Central I Africa. Remember. I can't remember, I'm afraid. Uh -huh. No, it was Central Africa. Um, I also then, I was hit by a car and I broke my elbow in a, in, um, oh, in shit. Central Africa. Um, and I believe that was semi on purpose. It was just their wing mirror, but mm -hmm. it hit me so hard, mm -hmm. um, that my, my elbow broke. But, um, I so think did you have to was, put it in a cast? Like how did that? Go down. No. Um, so I, I went to see a, a doctor like a, that was in the, in one of the embassies and they said, yeah, we well, if you want me to x-ray it, then we'll have to take a few days out. And I said, well, we don't have the days, so we don't know. And then I went back on one of my passport pickups. So one of my many times where I've had to go back and exchange passports. Back to the UK. Back to the UK for like 12 hours. Um, and then I, <laughs> I went and got my, yeah, exactly. And I got my, got oh my, my, my elbow looked at, so. Yeah. Um, wow. And so, yeah, there was those times when I did have to think about the the, re the religion was a really great eye opener. I tell mm. you what, even if you do this whole trip just to learn about religion, um, but I was I happened to be in uh, Saudi Arabia in Jeddah, um, mm -hmm. the day of Eid, where everyone gathers <laughs> at, at Mecca, um, uh, just the day, just the night before, and the families which were having these huge gatherings along the coast. It was just so beautiful to see, and I came very. Um, very, very kind of almost fell in love with the with the different range of religions that we have in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, it's another classic example of yeah. religions are seen as as war makers and bad sometimes yeah. when, yes, they are. But there's also the other side of the coin. I've been running in Jeddah. Have you? Yeah, I ran along the water. The Corniche. Yes. Yes, over the bridge and along. And you've got the, the couple of mosques. Um, tiny yeah, there's mosques. a couple of mosques yeah. right on the coastline or yeah. along there. Yeah, it's quite it's something. Nice. Yeah, were you running in day or night? Day. Day, okay. yeah. And I ran in shorts and that was a place where I got back and they said, you probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I, ran in, long, I ran in long things. Yeah. And I ran in shorts in Riyadh also and was told afterwards that that was not a good yeah, idea. Yeah, I think that's 
slightly yeah. more frowned upon there. Isn't and, I, and it was just, it was ignorance, really. I yeah. just didn't, I just didn't know. But, yeah. I, but that's the same. I've been in places yeah. where I thought it was absolutely fine mm-hmm. um, or where I've been running around places during prayer time and anywhere else it would have been fine. But at the moment I was in the wrong place mm. at the wrong time and I was disrespecting people by not giving them space. And, you know, you make those, you make those mistakes and right. you learn. So. so now that you're home, Mm. And you flip on the news and it's Brexit and it's Trump <laughs> and it's, you know, insanity and all of that. Like, what is the lens through which you kind of process all of that, given the worldliness, you know, of your adventure? Yeah. I d- yeah, worldliness. I definitely do feel worldly. I definitely also feel like I'm not as worldly as I want to be still. Because in all of those places we just discussed, there's so much more to be learned. Mm. And the, the yeah, amount- to be there for a day. Yeah, exactly. Be there mm. for a day. I mean, you still run 26 miles. It's still a lot, lot to see. But actually to take into people's religions and what they do at meal times and all that sort of stuff. So when I when I look at the news, my lens of this whole new worldview that I have, um, it's one of sadness on one part because I want there to be more positivity and to show the great things that I've experienced. But then on the other hand, complete elation and joy at how lucky I feel to have seen everything. Um, and then of course you have Brexit and Trump and all of the the squabbling, mm-hmm. the squabbling over things that, ah, you know, I wish we could just spend a little bit of time, just give us 10 minutes of the news a day talking about the problems that are happening in the Congo or mm-hmm. in Sierra Leone or, you know, um, and, and uh, yeah. There's, 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 there's lots of ways to look at it. It's frustration, to be honest. Yeah. My, most of what I see is frustration now because I want to do more. I want to be able to shake people and rattle them and go, oh, why are you moaning about Brexit again or moaning about your commute? You know, right. <laughs> the world has, has its own thing. Well, it takes some crazy event to yeah. rejigger people's, you know, sense of priorities. And, and that's, you know, to bring it back to Kobe Bryant. I mean, that's yeah. kind of the, you know, everything kind of stopped on yeah. Sunday when yeah. that happened. It was so shocking. And, and and absolutely surreal. It was an v- incredibly foggy morning here. Like you couldn't, the visibility so, yeah. was almost nothing. So there was, if, and that's sort of unusual. And it was just a bizarre, there was a weird heaviness where everything just stopped for a minute. Yeah. And yeah. the whole world like bore witness to this thing that had happened. And it allowed us to kind of connect with what's truly important the and preciousness of the life. question yeah the question then arises is why can't we make that more you know top of mind in yeah. our daily decision making and how we navigate the world and i hope and you say that you know what do people want to get out of my talks when i speak to them and it's that you know it's yeah. it's it's not having something in your life or going to somebody's funeral or seeing something bad happen on the news for you to wake up and realize that every moment that we have of every day is 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 so privileged mm. we are, especially us in, in the Western world, yeah. in this privileged society, we have so much that we can give and we can do, even if it's just, you know, spending more time with your family or saying to your loved ones that you love them more or going and doing that pottery course or that singing lesson or whatever it is that you're putting off, you know, the tomorrow may not happen. And luckily for Kobe, he's he's had this incredible life where he's done a lot, but I guarantee there's also things there that he hadn't done yet that he'd mm-hmm. wanted to do. Yeah, um, no, I think that there were a lot of things that yeah. he, you know, he had a lot of things that he was working on and wanted to, you know, express in his life. And then, you know, his daughter and the, you know, the, so the, the, the other people that were on that. It's just, it's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Not to end on that note, mm. I do want to know uh, what your banker buddies think. Like now that you're back, <laughs> are you still connected with the people that you used to work it's, with? Like, yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, lot, like yeah. how, does that, how does that go? A lot of my friends, <laughs> it's, I mean, I'm, well, I'm turning up to see them now when I'm living in a van. So that's, that's uh-huh. a difference. Right. <laughs> They're living in a converted you're, van. You're like the weird guy down by the river now. I exactly, exactly <laughs> that, Rich. <laughs> I, um, it's, um, to be fair, I think some of them look at it in, in envy in a little way, not just the traveling bit, but just mm-hmm. the change that I had the, I had the jump, but also, um, a lot of them still think I'm crazy, <laughs> you know, yeah. turning around, turning, turning your back on, on money. And, and I mean, it wasn't, it's, it's, it's not extreme, but it, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's both sides of the coin. They don't, they definitely think, but, but my true friends, they know that it was always in me yeah. to do it. And so it's some, and many of them, a great friend of mine, right. Andy, who I used to work with, he came and did 19 with me, 19 wow. countries, 19 wow. marathons. And he was just coming out for the weekend and started in Brazil and we did, oh, that's um, cool. we ran in Chernobyl together, all sorts yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Family's good. Yeah, family's good. My parents bless them. Um, my my dad shook my hand at the end when we had our 
our, our little final closing thing in uh, in Athens and and said never again. <laughs> he he, yeah. he honestly they, they have been so great and and my uh. brother throughout my brother is um slightly younger than me and he's a nurse and he took 6 months out of his job and life to convert this van that I'm now living in so when I returned home I, oh, wow. I could cool. I didn't have to go back into the uh-huh. into that life and so I could kind of seamlessly progress. So yeah, the amount of people, um, I, and I said I've said this a few times. I've I've had I've got just over two thousand new contacts in my phone from all over the world. And so when when there's holidays all over the place, or when there's religious occasions happening in the world, I get these messages wishing me, right. r- you know, from everywhere. But it's got to be like, wait, who's this guy? Like, what country did I meet him in? <laughs> like, you but know. I, I've saved people's <laughs> names with the country next oh, you to have. them, okay. <laughs> just because it's a so photograph. Strange. Like, you know, I, I you know, it would be hard to keep all that straight. I would yeah, imagine. It is. It is but it's great for contacts because I've now been able to help other people that want to travel. And mm. so on my website, I have yeah. this, you know. You could set up a whole consulting business around this. Which, yeah, yeah, I'm trying. You're like a fixer. I'm a, exactly. I'm a, fix, <laughs> yeah. I'm a fixer that can't remember where I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I've got a lot of great people that can help. So, uh-huh. I mean, along with that, um, th- this next focus for me is this, this year is, is the speaking tour. I'm also doing a few little mini runs. We're going to circumnavigate Iceland. We're going to run around. Uh, That's a mini run. Mini run, thousand miles, a couple of weeks. Yeah. We're trying to trying to do that. That's going to be beautiful, um, difficult, more enduring, yeah. certainly on the body. I know there's a cycling race that goes around it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a beautiful tarmac right. road all the way around this, right. all around the country. Um, and then I'm gathering a few people with um, with the brand that's been supporting me for for years. Do Sport Live. They are giving me the reins to create a team to take out to Malawi, um, and we're going to run the length of Malawi. Oh, wow. Um, just for fun, just to gather some team yeah. that have have this, this whole ethos of of this brand is exactly what I breathe, which is be set free, similar to yourself, of just nice. being outdoors and live this world. So um, I'm putting that team together. Um, and other than that, it's, it's speaking to all time. Mm-hmm. So um, if anybody wants me to speak anywhere, then let me know because I want to share the journey. And I think, I mean, it's all very well doing this over... A conversation, but the amount of photos and videos that kind of illustrate the the dodgy moments kind of paint it yeah. better than I can. Well, good man, it's all good. No, thank you. I'm yeah. so grateful for you having me on. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, you know, I I can't congratulate you enough. I I just can't even wrap my head around what you've accomplished. It's it's really quite something. Super inspiring, and uh, I can't wait to see you get out in the world and, and and share this message. I think it's super important. So my hat's off to you, and and I am here as a resource and of service. So if you ever need Thank anything you, yeah. from me, yeah, I'd love to help you out. Thank you, man. No, I'm uh, I'm very grateful, and you've you know what you're doing. I think uh, many people underestimate the power of good that you're doing. So I'm grateful. Thank it's you. Just me rich. sitting in my house talking to. Talking to people, people like yourself. Yeah, I know, man. and it makes a whole lot of difference. <laughs> it makes a whole lot of difference. Um, and when uh, when somebody else goes and does this record, or whenever something else happens, and uh, we can we can share that moment because I'm looking forward to that day. So. I like how how enthusiastic you are about somebody else, whether it's Dean or somebody else, going out and 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 and. Yeah. breaking your record or oh, I want it to be it, Dean. Yeah. I want it to be yeah. Dean. I've followed him. I'm a huge fan. I've, I absolutely love the man. Um, uh, and I, I genuinely want to watch mm-hmm. the trip unfold without having to be in the painful <laughs> positions of being You're like, oh, planes. he's there. I remember that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I hope I can cool. be a part of it as well. Thanks, Rich. Nice, really man. Grateful. Thank you. So if you want to connect with Nick, nickbutter.com, at nickbutterrun on Instagram and Twitter. And in terms of speaking, the whole tour is in the UK right now, right? You got the whole schedule. It's laid in the out UK. There. We've got, I mean, I've got another dozen countries that we're popping yeah. to, so anywhere. But cool. the UK is, pr- yeah, probably. right. But you'll update that as yeah. that stuff yeah. um, continues along. Book coming out at some point. Documentary. Yeah. All, all good stuff, man. So let me know when all that stuff is ready, and I'll I'll help push the word out. Thank about you very that. much. Yeah, appreciate thank it. you. All right, man. Peace. Lance.